Okay, so look at that picture. It's absolutely wonderful. Um, we have Christoph with us today. Christoph is an artist, teacher, curator, and writer um, who often works with language, voice, bodies, performance, intimacy, complicity, and endurance. That's an amazing set of words, isn't it? Um, he obtained an MFA from NSCAD in 1996 and a PhD from the Department of Performance Studies at the Tisch School of Arts, New York University in 2007. He's released numerous solo and collaborative audio CDs on various labels and has performed and exhibited internationally. A book compiling his writings on sound art called Sonic Somatic Performances of the Unsound Body was published in 2012 by Errant Bodies Press. I know a lot of you um, will have looked into that book, I think, over the years. Um, Christoph is also a founding member of Avatar in Quebec City and with Alexandre Saint Ange, who runs Squint Press truly brilliant press. Um, he's recently uh, was the recipient of the Glenfiddich Artist Residency with Mara Hadley and is currently curating a 12-year event titled You and I are Water, Earth, Fire, Air of Life and Death. I hope I got that right. 2020 to 2031. Um, and I'm going to leave it there. Christoph is a, uh, an associate professor um, and I've, I've forgotten whereabouts now. Uh, Christoph will tell you about that in a second. <laughs> um, but I'm going to hand over to Christoph now because I'm taking up too much time. Use the chat. Enjoy the session. Um, this is a great, great afternoon. Thanks again, Christoph, and thank you, Salome. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Mark. Um, Western, Western University in, in London, Ontario, uh, which is two hours from where I live in Toronto. Um, Thanks, Mark, for the invitation, and thanks to Salome for stepping in for the Q&A. Um, honored to be part of this series. Um, glad to be here. Well, not here, in, in a sense. Um, of course, I'd rather be uh, there in person, and, and the certain things that I would have done in person, some performative gestures, that I don't think uh, translate well on screen. So I adapted uh, my talk accordingly. Um, so I will go to my PowerPoint before I do anything else. And just take a second. So for the last uh, decade or so, here's that image again. Um, I used to title my talks, Talk Artist, which is not much of a diversion from the standard uh, name. Uh, we usually give these talks, artist talks, but that transposition inversion um, enabled me to contextualize the kind of um, uh, the the other side of communication, mainly miscommunication and non-communication. Um, so the, the spirit of that is still there uh, in this talk today, but um, I wanted to try out uh, a different title or different titles. Um, and that one that you see here maybe is not uh, that visible and or two very simple conjunctions uh, but for me uh, they are kind of signposts for an opening um, um, op opening up of possibilities uh, it's their connective words uh, obviously they suggest series, uh, they imply iterations, they invite collaborations. Um, but um, here, so the, the and or is kind of one basic uh, principle, but there's this uh, subtitle or 
alternate title that I also wanted to introduce. Um, our bodies doing their best without us. And then we see mouths open as if they wanted, wanted to say everything. That uh, as the plethora of microphones you see here um, introduces this idea of plural, plural, plurality of collectives. Um, that being said, the origin um, of, of this phrase is, is a, and, and the reason, one of the reasons I, I, I'm starting off with this is that it's a, it's a title to an upcoming um, album. Um, and so just, just last week, we, we finalized it. Uh, and by we, I mean um, Alexandre, Saint-Onge and I, who Mark mentioned, uh, we both run Squint Press, but we also have a duo um, since uh, 1997 that's been sporadically active. But this year, we'll have a couple of new releases, so and probably some performances in Europe in the fall. So the first version of the sentence had a collectivity front and center. This one is um, more abstracted, uh, neutral, if you will, a body doing its best without self, and then the mouth opens as if it wanted to say nothing. Whenever I find a, a title, and for me, titles are a really crucial uh, part of the process. Uh, sometimes it's sometimes I start with a title, and that kind of a piece unfolds uh, from it in a very direct way. And sometimes it's just it's just uh, some something that comes at the end, or that seems to emerge from the work. But um, it's always something that um, is a, a crucial com component. And for me, this sentence, uh, just the fact that I've given you already two uh, versions of it, uh, it's a sign that uh, I'm interesting, uh, I'm interested in the in it enough to try to explore not only what is the best phrasing, but perhaps it's it's uh, a phrasing that's rich enough to present as a set of permutations. Perhaps I haven't uh, fully explored that. And this is actually the the title of the album: uh, "My Body Doing Its Best Without Me." And then you see the mouth open as if it wanted to say something. I actually can't claim uh, authorship of this title. It's it has uh, two phrases in it, and the sources of those two phrases are uh, Samuel Beckett and Marguerite Duras. Um, for this album and for other albums that uh, Alexandre and I have done, we've used a similar strategy of looking at authors that uh, we uh, both adore, picking a book, sometimes picking a specific page, and, and try to see if that uh, is a good match, uh, a good pairing with um, our sounds. So in this case, this, um, this is how we combine uh, these two authors. So, um, as you see at the bottom, l'étranglement, which is a French word uh, for strangling. Uh, and the years are 2000 to 2022. In the last couple of years, perhaps partly related to confinement, but um, it, it was already brewing be beforehand uh, because I have been in the process of digitizing my archive. Um, in some cases, uh, that process of filtering, filtering through the past has 
um, triggered um, a desire to return to that a particular piece and to um, present it partly as documentation, so uh, still be referential to that original uh, instance, but also make a new piece out of it. So it's a it's a, it's a balance between the two. Uh, so uh, this was done a couple of years ago and then finalized last year. Um, a technical um, byproduct of this digitizing of um, analog or um, uh, that digital audio tapes, uh, various formats, sometimes glitches arise. And this is what you're seeing now on the screen. These were not intentional. This is another uh, view of it. Um, this is a performance we did in Montreal in 2000. Um, Alexandre is on the left, I'm on the right. And in the center is a guest, uh, André Eric Letourneau, uh, another performance artist from Montreal. And he has a device that is monitor monitoring his blood flow. And we are gently strangling each other and we have contact mics um, um, on our necks. So you next see an excerpt from the video that was done uh, two years ago for one of my uh, December 12 events, which I'll, I'll get to. And um, you'll get this both, I think, a sense of the original sound, but also a sense of what this uh, technological unplanned glitch uh, added to both the visuals and uh, the sonic, the soundtrack. Okay, um, so that was the beginning of the performance. It uh, lasts close to half an hour. Um, even though the talk, and this is a great part about this, uh, how this uh, series was devised, the talk allows for more than 
um, more time than usual for an artist talk, I, I'm still I still opt to give you um, in certain some cases excerpts, um, but longer ones. But at least um, um, so that I, I so that I could present to you uh, a, a good breadth of of my work, both uh, um, going quite a quite a ways in the past to the beginnings and and some quite current in this instance as i said it's it's kind of a mix of both um so l'étranglement you just saw two or three minutes of the very beginning of the performance and up next is the end and part of what interests me and that's reflected in this title uh, that comes from Beckett and Duras is this notion of a body that is not quite in control of itself. And that's, that's true for all of us. Um, you can think of kind of mundane things like uh, sneezing, um, obviously um, breathing is not, uh, is, we don't have, at least we don't have full control of it. Um, and those are kind of basics that I've I, I often return to because um, they fascinated me to uh, to how kind of that micro aspect of, um, of of control and power also can therefore be transposed or or, or looked at in a societal way. Um, I tend not to veer in that direction, but I'm not, uh, I do see the connections and I think there are connections. So there's a kind of a social political dimension that uh, I think is uh, underscored or perhaps um, is latent in the work. Anyway, uh, that's a bit of a tangent here is uh, part two, uh, well, actually, yeah, part two, meaning the last, the end of the performance, where you get a, a sense of the, the sweating, the arms getting tired, and that kind of the durational element reflected in what you are about to see. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'm, I would say that the, the performance has a certain kind of viscerality, uh, especially in how the sound was treated. Um, and I think the technical glitches uh, enhanced, further enhanced that. But it's also, at least the, perform the performative gesture um, is rooted in a certain kind of passiveness. Um, we are basically idle, uh, waiting, silent. Um, and that contradiction, that paradox is something that uh, is, is, I think, a recurring strategy that uh, I end up finding myself using. So in terms of orality, it's, it's obstructed, if you will. We are at each other's throats. We're not letting ourselves talk. Um, the breath is constrained. So I wanted to, that kind of brought to mind um, one of my first videos, which is uh, uh, perhaps the opposite in the sense that in that instance, uh, which you'll see in a second, the oral is unbounded, uh, unleashed, raw, and guttural. It's from um, 1996. Um, I put it up on YouTube, um, again, in that process of uh, looking at the archive um, three years ago, early on in the pandemic. And very shortly thereafter, um, I received a... Uh, th this is a... a slide it's called the tenor and the vehicle um it says 95 but i believe it's 96. Um, so after posting this video i received a notice that um, it was flagged for review um, something about vulgar or sexual language not appropriate i mean i know that's kind of a gen generic content description there that you see in this uh, message from the YouTube team. Um, I'll let you judge for yourself what m m might have triggered this. Um, it's basically a video of uh, a small microphone in my mouth. Thank <laughs> you. 
instance uh, you saw the entire piece it's just under five minutes the uh, top half or a bit more than half is intentionally blacked out centered um, I really wanted to focus on the mouth even though it's you know I've saturated the image so that it's not immediately discernible that it's a mouth uh, I think uh, speaking of censorship, back to the YouTube uh, question. I submitted an appeal and this was YouTube's answer. So not much of a conversation there. Um, I never, my appeal basically consisted of me describing the video. Um, and uh, I thought that would suffice as a, explanation and therefore the restriction would be lifted but uh, that, that, that was it. Um, in many ways I, I, I kind of love these kinds of moments where you know the art, the art you produce is out in the world and, and here's a instance where presumably via a member of the public finding taking a umbrage to it or finding it offensive in some way uh, manifest their displeasure by uh, going to uh, by by wanting to censor it and um, I mean I, I'm not happy about it but uh, but it it's a sign of a response I suppose a sign of some uh, uh, something that kind of reaction I think uh, is worth examining in some way. Um, at least in this case, it's only conjecture. Um, but so be it. Uh, this brought to mind uh, uh, another piece with a French title, Eternuité. It's, it's actually a neologism between Eternité, which means eternity, and éternué, which means means sneezing. In 2008, I had received a commission that was 
for an audio piece that was quite unusual because uh, the, there was a time restriction. Uh, I had to provide them uh, with a 10 second piece. So there's not much you can do in 10 seconds, but you can definitely sneeze. Um, I happen to be at the Banff Center doing a residency. A Banff Center is in Alberta, Canada, and it's quite world renowned uh, facility. Um, in beautiful uh, Rockies, mountains, uh, very uh, idyllic. And um, what I, I booked a studio and I asked uh, some people that were also doing residencies to come in and to attempt to sneeze. There is a, a, a connection via YouTube uh, to this, uh, but I'll first show you a bit more. Um, some excerpts of, of this piece. Um, first of all, I guess I should say that even though my initial plan uh, was to just end up with a sneeze that uh, that is not more than 10 seconds and submit the audio piece, so the visual documentation was through the glass of the from the uh, control room to the sound booth. You see in the center image the the reflection of Aaron's face. Um, not ideal in some ways, but I, I quite like that happenstance. So the piece ended up being a video um, uh, edit of these uh, several people who uh, ended up uh, attempting to sneeze. And you see that I had provided some uh, potential triggers like uh, peppers, I think the next image will show you uh, kind of a behind the scenes. The microphone was quite high. High. There was some concern about people sneezing into a microphone in terms of germs, um, which quite rightly so. And uh, these are the several uh, accoutrements to, to uh, aid the people who were attempting to sneeze.
So um, that was Aaron, and that was the basically um, there was quite a lot of people, maybe close to ten, who attempted to sneeze through a day of recording, and she was the only one who was able to. She was quite pleased with herself, and I was quite happy that uh, at least I had my my uh, my sound piece. Um, I mentioned a link uh, to YouTube with that uh, sneezing piece. I'll just go back to this. Um, when I posted this video, and what you saw in the in the four windows uh, is just something I prepared for PowerPoint. It's basically a, a single person, one person at a time. It's about a half hour video, uh, and. Um, after several months of uh, posting that video, uh, along with a batch of other work uh, some years ago, um, I noticed that this video had garnered a lot more views. Uh, I think it was in the thousands as opposed to much more modest uh, hundreds or so of other ones uh, of my work. Um, and I did some digging and it it turns out that this video had been posted on a sneeze fetish site um, and had spread that way. So another kind of instance for me of, you know, the, this work of art or from an artist perspective, um, um, art production that essentially almost always kind of lives within that world and is discussed and presented in that context um it uh, kind of uh, traveling uh, outside of those bounds is is uh, fascinating to me how how that happens all right <laughs> so i'm going to go back now to hole in the head which was my first cd it came out in 1996 uh, and features the work I did on radio in the early 90s, some maybe even uh, late 80s. Um, I became an artist through radio, um, and I would almost say unintentionally. Um, I was doing radio, and I, was, I got into radio because I loved music, and I had friends who were doing radio, and I was, uh, and I think I remain a, uh, a pretty shy uh, person, uh, introvert, and somehow speaking into a microphone seemed easier than speaking uh, to uh, a person, or at least it's more in group situations that the shyness comes out. Um, but um, I quickly realized that for me, what interested me about radio it was uh, to try to bend the conventions of radio. Even if you're doing uh, radio uh, and featuring experimental music, there are conventions of you say what's coming up next, you say the time, uh, you're listening to CKUT FM in Montreal. Um, you know, here's the phone number if you want to call. Those, those kinds of things, uh, I... I felt compelled to try to uh, play around with them as much as possible. So um, I did live weekly radio for close to 10 years uh, at different stations, but uh, a lot of what you'll hear next was from my regular program called Danger in Paradise. Um, that was on CKUT FM in Montreal. Uh, here is one uh, respondent to um, the particular theme that week was to describe yourself. So a very simple prompt. But by that time, I had uh, a kind of a regular listenership, and they were they were in into the, the kind of the the game plan, if you will, that I had. Uh, developed over uh, several weeks, months, uh, years of, I, I guess people 
knew that on Wednesday evenings from 10 to midnight, uh, the parameters could, um, could be explored. There was a lot of play. And this response, I think, in a very concise, playful way, uh, reflects the spirit of that program. Hi, I would describe myself as highly sexualized, perverted, computerized, audiophonic, loud, and obnoxious, basically, very human. Um, so for this CD, um, I had uh, many, these were all recorded on cassette tapes, analog cassette tapes, and um, then transferred to real to real and some of them were edited analog this was right around the time where i slowly got access to a digital um, software um, i was mostly working with sound designer which is a predecessor to pro tools sound designer was just two track there were no plugins it's basically a digital tool for editing um, i have no nostalgia for the razor blades and the thousands of edits I did uh, using that technology. Uh, for me, uh, transposing, tra transferring my interest in sound in terms of production to the computer was revelatory, or at least opened up a lot of uh, possibilities. So what you'll hear here is mostly digital, albeit, as I said, very simple, very basic software um, done in the uh, early 90s. Some at the Banff Center, which was where I first got access to that software, and then the rest of it uh, when I, I was living in Montreal at the time, so in, in Montreal. This is about a 10-minute excerpt of the title piece. Oh, <laughs> 
Off. On. In all his many ballads and singer. Off. Jenny Lind, they throw flowers. On. Bokeria va nu Maria. Six years, Madame Lord in Nazita. Off. They man's on her feet with her ship. Off. As a wedding present, it fell in her long mantle in removing it in a luxuriously furnished grotto. Disembarking of Cythera, torch of the bone angel. Gambetta in the arms of the general. They had cores on its knees. Marble from Easter procession in Spain. The white eagle ones very high up. Like the sails of a ship by the painter Boucher. Seemed as well as like a torch of the wonders of the world in her nubshell veils. <sighs> A, A, B, 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 C, 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 A, B, C, A, B, C, A, B, C, Je viens par la présence vous frères connaîtres mon audace. Je suis présent, gens où si vous voutles mes les. Je vous dis que c'est un sortant pour que mes azers au choix. Je vous dis que c'est des flûtes par là. I hear a sound. <laughs> Dear doctor, it's been 17 months since I was confined to doctoral intelligence. I see no point in mincing words with an individual of your ilk. what goes on in this place of caring, rest, and tranquility. Okay, so you got a, I think, a little bit of a, a sense of um, uh, of the kind of style of how I, uh, in this, in that particular instance, and maybe with some of the other work, um, a lot of snippets that are strung together with recurring elements. Um, some radio static, there's some listener phone calls, and then I'm working with uh, some texts. I won't go too much uh, more into details of those texts, but um, I, uh, suffice to say that it's communication, miscommunication, non-communication is, is paramount uh, in those, it, in, in my interest in, in language and also how it's uh, conveyed, how it's spoken, uh, read, and and then as a next step, how it's manipulated uh, when editing. I mentioned um, just earlier 
um, starting to work in with digital tools. Um, but in the mid nineties, I went back to using reel to reels, uh, but with a very different approach to it. Um, uh, I was using the reel to reel machine. I had a bunch of portable ones, um, as a noise making tool, essentially, this is the cover of, a. Uh, of a 2LP uh, publication that came out in 2012 that features that work. Um, and that's, this is the front cover. Uh, I was a contortionist very early on in my life. Uh, I'm no longer as bendable. Uh, this is one of the inserts. And here you have some views of the reel to reel machine. It's been gutted. It's no longer able to play tapes, but the motors and um, everything else is still working. And so I use contact mics to activate it, to uh, make sounds emerge from it in a, in a very kind of a um, symbiotic way where the machine and me become, uh, become one. I mean, that sounds perhaps a bit too, uh, uh, glib or naive. Here are two excerpts from a performance uh, using this tool that I did um, at a festival in Lausanne in 2017. <laughs>
so um, I, returning to YouTube, I, I just noticed as I was uh, preparing this that uh, somebody commented on that video uh, and said, it's like watching a guitarist play jazz drums on a reel-to-reel. Uh, and that person, that person's name on YouTube is Cringe Sound. Um, I've used this um, quite often this uh, as my kind of live setup. Um, I like the limitation that it's just me, this machine, uh, a bunch of uh, contact mics. My hands uh, often get quite bruised up uh, when I play. The sets tend to be quite short. When it's in the context of playing with others and I'm using the same tools, I, I'm not less uh, frenetic and it's uh, I, I tend to explore the textures more that I can um, get from the machine and how I manipulate the contact microphones. So there is at least a, a way that perhaps was not really perceivable in these two excerpts, the way to use that uh, instrumentation in a in a gentler way, if you will, or at least, uh, yeah, as a kind of more as an environment. Um, this was obviously uh, the opposite of that. Um, shifting gears now to um, a collaboration that emerged out a 2019 residency that uh, my partner Marla Hilady and I did uh, at the Glenfiddich Distillery in uh, Dufftown, Scotland, about three hours north of Edinburgh, if I'm not mistaken, um, in Speyside. Uh, we lived in the distillery for three months over that summer of 2019. And um, this is the piece that a bunch of pieces came out of it. And I'll talk about two, one mostly and then two others. Um, what you are seeing here is a gallery view of the work exhibited uh, at Christie Contemporary in Toronto last uh, October, November. Um, and the next images, I'll, I'll run through a little bit of the, the context. Close up. These are two swan necks. That's the technical term. They're part of stills. Um, and these stills were retired from, they happen to be retired. They have a lifespan of about 12 years uh, while we were there. So uh, that, and the fact that they're called swan necks and they kind of look like horns uh, made us think of swan song. Um, and so we asked if we could get uh, the swan neck part of these two stills that were removed from the distillery. And they're removed from the the roofs. The roofs are, there are sections of the roofs that can be removed. It's a day long operation. It's quite uh, interesting. Uh, here standing up, you see the two new uh, the stills that are going to be installed and lying down in the shade. And you see the two stills that were removed. And this is uh, um, Dennis the Menace was his name, uh, a legend at Glenfiddich, a master coppersmith uh, cutting the necks for us uh, freehand. We had, he had asked us how much of the neck we wanted and then he just did the cut. And here you see the two necks that you saw earlier in the gallery context and the remaining part of the stills just gives a bit of a sense of the scale and this we did not anticipate happening um, uh, but this was at the opening uh, this was the first exhibition we did in scotland at the distillery they have a, a little gallery there and that was quite a nice uh unexpected um, 
thing to have the audience um, insert themselves into the swan necks. You, I won't describe it too much because there's a video excerpt that documents uh, how the sound works. Back to the gallery view, now that you have a bit of an idea of where these two swan necks come from. And if I'm not mistaken now, uh, a short documentary, an excerpt from the documentary of, of the installation. And so you get a sense of the sound in the room. <laughs>
bit of a taste of how it sounded in the room. It's not the same, obviously. It's very spatial, uh, especially if you insert yourself in one of the necks, but just moving around, uh, some very localized sounds. Uh, hopefully you got a sense that the arms that move kind of like construction cranes are triggering the sounds on and off. The arms move at different speeds for different um, for different amounts. Um, so it's a ever evolving composition. There are eight sounds and some of the sound, all of the sounds were recorded that summer uh, on site. Some are um, kind of industrial type, type sounds of different, uh, the, the bottling plant, uh, where the casks are being repaired, and so on and so forth. And then there's also a choir. Um, the choir um, volunteers were um, asked to uh, come over to where we were living uh, on the distillery grounds. and they didn't have to be trained singers or anything and our prompt was very uh, simple uh, it was to produce the highest pitch sound they could produce and to hold it as long as they could and and the lowest pitched one and then th the way that these recordings were used uh, dependent on how long they've been working on the site so i think the shortest was three months and the longest was 19 some years uh, so that was a st structural s starting point on how to arrange th the voices together. Um, what you see here um, is the publication that's actually going to be released on February 14th, um, next week or in two weeks, and uh, from uh, a label uh, in Portugal called Cronica. It's already available on Bandcamp um, and it features uh, kind of uh, working uh, on these sounds. Um, it's not a document of the installation per se, it's using the same sources. Uh, I mean, it's a visual documentation of the installation, but uh, what you heard on the video doesn't really appear uh, on the CD, uh, except at the beginning of this excerpt that I'm going to play next, which is uh, Swan Song number one. As you see at the bottom, it's a 20 minute piece. Uh, it really focuses quite a bit on the choir aspect. That's why I went, uh, I described it a bit more, uh, but um, you'll hear a much shorter amount. Uh, I'm realizing that I'm running out of time um, much earlier than I anticipated, but um, you'll hear a, a good chunk nonetheless, at least five minutes. Okay, I'm ro rolling by normal, rolling mix pre. Rolling mix pre six.
sorry to cut this short. I'm going to jump through a couple of small pieces. Um, I want to, uh, I mean, it's especially a shame to cut it short because it's a piece that, uh, as you can imagine, I think really envelops you after a while, uh, lulls you, but I think in, in a kind of active way. Um, this uh, piece, I think, will will wrap uh, back nicely to the uh, little play I did uh, or musings I did uh, about the title of this talk. Um, after Marla and I spent uh, or, or spent three months uh, at a distillery, um, I came to realize that al uh, whiskey, which is a word for alcohol, and alcohol is uh, is somewhat synonymous with water of life. Um, that water and life are just two components of 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 the process. There's uh, actually a lot more involved, and namely the you and I, the the person consuming, but also the person producing, and not to mention the other elements. So, um, I came up with, with a twelve word sentence that I thought uh, better exemplified a uh, more holistic, more comprehensive way of um, the making of, of alcohol. Uh, you and I are water, earth, fire, air of life and death. Um, I picked 12 uh, words because uh, the default for a single malt is a 12 year old scotch is kind of a, in terms of marketing that's um, what has happened over the last few decades. There are older, I think rarely younger scotches. Um, and Mark mentioned that in the intro that I'm uh, currently in the process of a 12 year long project. Um, and every December 12th, of course, I'm sticking to the 12s. There's a, I organize a 12 hour event from uh, noon until midnight. And um, so the next one coming up is R uh, in 2023, this year. So here you have the return to the, the phrase. And um, you, uh, these are actually um, bits of parts of a reel to reel uh, that I found on eBay. And I was really taken with the, 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 the striking, the, the striking uh, simplicity of the images. So I found as many as I, as I can uh, and then change the background uh, to, to have each year have its own kind of identity. Um, and um, there's a slowing down of the GIF over the span of the years. And then when the event happens, every hour also reflects the fact that if it's the first hour, it will have one of these parts. If the second hour, it will have two and so on and so forth. So there's a, a, a logic based on the number 12 that, that has been really helpful in, in framing this. It's very time consuming, but uh, it has um, been online mostly thus far because of obvious reasons. Um, and that has enabled uh, participation from all over the world. Last year, we had uh, a project from Hong Kong, from Melbourne, Australia, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think I'll actually end on time. There's, uh, I ran out of time as I intimated, but I think that's not a bad place to stop. Thank you so very much, Christoph, for a really um, such a rich talk and such a talk we re really gave us such a fantastic backwards history onto how you're working and how you've been working and really enjoying listening and, and, and also watching the pieces and seeing connections. And I have um, tried to once in a while poke, as I was told to do the chat, so that there would be questions already. However, I will start off with a with a question or a comment that maybe can be taken as a question and then we go. I will pick up on some of the questions that are already in the chat. And of course, I very much like to 
for people to grab the virtual mic and and speak the question themselves when I come to them if 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 you wish to do so because I think it's nice to hear different voices and to fill this room with different voices as if we were in another room but maybe just to warm up the room for questions a little bit more I start but but really struck me in this sort of backwards and now again forwards history that you've about your work that you've presented to us and of course I've known your work and you for a while and and so it was really um enriching that you started this off with the kind of strangulation piece and the strangulation piece for me had a sort of it was a techno viscerality because we couldn't hear you or your partner in this process of strangulation but we heard the machine we heard what what this did to to your bodies as a kind of measure but also as a kind of observer as to how far you would go and then when you went all the way back to 1996 to the hole in the head I felt I could hear I could hear some of that viscerality that was absent in the strangulation that wasn't that 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 wasn't in the in in the more recent piece but that a, a kind of a viscerality of finding a voice you also talked about your shyness and hence your your work on the radio which I think is then so interesting that you make these very guttural visceral sounds or gather them up or bring them into the radio that are not semantic that don't necessarily communicate but are solipsistic so in my head through the whole talk I made this envelope between this machine taking over the body then there was also the sentences between Duras and um, and Beckett that also hinted at who's in charge of the body who isn't and then from 1996 backwards we had this viscerality am I I mean how do you relate to this narrative if if I present you like that through this shift in the body presence mm, that's a difficult one um maybe I'll answer side in a sideways way um, um I, I i think the what radio opened up and the community around it and uh, the way i was able to express myself um was less about oh finally i have something to say and i have a vehicle but more you know you mentioned technology a few times uh I think is I was reading a lot of uh, the situationists. Um, I, I had read whatever I could find on radio uh, then. This was late eighties. Um, um, I had uh, I was interested in the work of Negative Land, who was doing a lot of cut ups and a kind of a, a critique of the media. I was also interested in punk and especially crass and uh, and uh, those UK based. Uh, uh, where anarchism was, you know, front and center. So there was a there was a politics around it, um, and I guess maybe the gist of all this is a kind of certain anger, uh, a, a certain kind of uh, resistance to I'm coming into adulthood, and the world is fucked up. You know, to make it as say it as bluntly as that. So yes, you can express that. Uh, you join a punk band. Uh, I had. I was working with radio. This that was my band, if you will. Um, I, I, I don't know what attracted me per se instantly to, to finding kind of guttural ways, uh, and maybe a way that I've explained it in the past is here I am, the medium of radio. Uh, I'm behind a microphone. So when I realize that I'm no longer interested, or I no, I I don't want to play into those conventions of saying the time and the call letters and and the phone number of the radio station, what do I do with this microphone? Well, I put it in my mouth. I see what the saliva is going to do. I see how what kind of noises emerge, how different types of microphones react and how I can start working my mouth in different ways and, and see what sounds emerge. And then once I started rec uh, recording and once I learned how to edit, then other th possibilities emerged out of that. Doesn't quite answer your question, but it's the beginning. Thank you very much. Um, and in the meantime, we have some questions. So I want to, I'm just going to go chronologically, but please, please, um, everybody, just 
put your questions in the chat or just say in the chat, maybe I want to ask a question and I get to you. But the first question is by Francisco Mazza. If you want to just open your mic and ask it yourself. Hi, hello. Can you hear me? Hi, we hear yeah. you. Well. Okay. Thank you, Salome. Uh, yeah, just come back to the chat. I completely forgot my question, but it's, it's related to the first part of your presentation, Chris. A wonderful presentation, by the way, very provoking and very inspiring. Um, when you work with archive material, especially, um, so I found the question um, How do you generally embrace glitz and the unexpected with the final aesthetic decisions in your work in terms of documenting the performance? And some way you need to you know, establish. Uh, how are you going to saturate the image or what kind of treatment of sound? It's more intuitive in some ways, or there's some pre preconceived ideas and contextual elements be if, behind yeah. that. Yeah, thanks for your question. It's, it's, it's very present in my mind. It, it's definitely a case by case. Um, I think each piece, uh, as you know, I found it in the archive. Uh, and sometimes I had already kind of a premonition or a, amongst, uh, because I've been around for several decades, I have a lot to sift through. Um, and But some pieces have stuck with me. So I, I usually begin with those and see if, you know, 15 years later, I look at it. Is it something that I still want to present, but maybe only kind of verbatim as is, or I, I feel a, a, a totally open and 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 I I think I, I don't hold the original moment as as um, uh, any preciousness to it uh, or any responsibility to to keep it as is. Um, it's it's basically re re-rendering as raw material. I, I I don't think it's a bad mm. idea. Uh, or necessarily bad. Sometimes I, I have some things I haven't done yet, but I want to recreate some pieces. Um, the spit bottle, which I didn't feature, I've, I've done two of those. Uh, and I like the idea of a kind of stereophonic approach to some mm -hmm. objects. Um, so all this to say, I think case by case, which I guess would fit with your notion of intuitive. Um, um, and and it's also depending on time, depending on on inspiration in the moment. Great, thank you. Thank you. I can't hear you, Salome. You're in good, Salome. Sorry, yeah, I switched my mic off because I tried not to make any 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 disturbances. Kath, you had actually the first. First comment, was there a question in there? Would you like to um, take the mic and tell us the question? No, maybe not, or maybe the mic isn't working. Basically, Kath made a comment, made a comment about the um, the censorship by YouTube, and you can read it in the in the chat about this sort of issue with, with skin and how they probably found their own narrative on that, the basis of that, um, the censorship came about. So some very interesting observation along that, how they fill the gaps and, and make up their own stories on which they base censorship, which is very interesting. And then Anne, Anne Bourne, you made a few comments and, and very interesting observations as you went through the talk. Did you want to articulate any of those as a question? Hi, sure. Hi, Christoph. Hi, Anne. How are you? Good. Um, I, I just kind of went stream of consciousness consciousness while your pieces were showing, but now I'm thinking about the through line of your engaging community since your radio show when you invited people to, you know, kind of extemporize uh, about themselves and to to this kind of shift where... I don't know, right up to where the, you involved a choir that was from the community around the still. And it, it it's really interesting to me. I, I wonder if you could speak about that a little bit, because you're not, um, it's like there's no narrative that you try to control, but you, you, you can provoke so that this very soulful quality of sound comes into the piece. 
Uh, I'm really, really amazed by that. Oh, thanks. I'll, I'll try to tackle that. Uh, perhaps a, one brief um, return to Kat's comment. Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great uh, conjecture that you had. Um, I, I wish it was that. My suspicion is more that the, the person heard the kind of noi noisy sounds and was offended by the sounds. Uh, uh, kind of a more kind of immediate, uh, simplistic reaction to, uh, to, to that. But that's also conjecture, obviously. Um, now, and yeah, th this, this linkage between my work with, uh, on the radio with this kind of a sense of your community, uh, a, a listenership that I try to activate. Um, um, I'm, I'm aware, I think more since then, more, more now that uh, of, of the problemat problematics of appropriation. Um, so I don't feel as free license to use anybody else's voices. So bringing to the choir, the, the choir was, I mean, it's a makeshift choir. It's a, a, a choir in name only in the sense that the people came one by one and they were, uh, we made it, we made the, these recordings into a choir. Um, we're not a functioning choir, just, just to be clear. Um, I, I think what Marla and I felt that in the same way that we were uh, working on a sculpture, that had a kinetic uh, element, how to weave in the sounds that we were recording. And it just felt in the same way as I ended up with this 12 word sentence, in the same way is that the recordings of the site are kind of nothing, at least in this particular instance, if they don't, don't also include the, the sounds of the people who work there, who, it's part of their daily lives and it seemed really crucial to incorporate that it also i think was greatly influenced by the fact that swan song was the title and then you immediately think of voice and sometimes i'm inclined to to uh, not go with the obvious but in this instance song it song made sense to have the presence of voice uh, front and center Beautiful. It's a stunning work. Thanks. Thank Same. you. And then we have a question, a comment question from Aaron. Did you want to um, articulate it or should I read it? Be great if you wanted to take the mic. or write in the chat if that's technically not possible. Okay. Maybe I start and I may be misinterpreted, so then you butt in and tell me whether that is right. So Aaron writes, there was a passage earlier in the talk where Christoph talked of sneezing as the body losing control, but I felt like that would be more like the body taking control until I saw that the performers, participants were inducing it to sneeze. I therefore began thinking that performance life art and some of Christoph's work sometimes seems open up, a, it seems to open up a discussion between the body and the self. But to be specific sonically, the distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic bodily sound. This seems true in a l'estranglement. Too, is this something he is, or you are, I'm asking you, conscious about when making this type of work? Um, I find this interesting as it appears to cross over with current scientific research and focuses on the more than human world. So the question is about your consciousness about this um, distinction. Yeah, uh, thanks, Aaron, for that question. Um, I I wouldn't say that I wouldn't. While I would not lean entirely into into intuition, although I I, I do value that, and I, I teach uh, in, in an art department, and and that comes up a lot. It's it's difficult to articulate and to to yeah to find a, a conversation th through line um uh through that because it it seems so personal at least uh, at the start but um 
I'm not the the theory the theory side of things uh, when I write for example and I do research um, oftentimes there are echoes and parallels um, sometimes the work comes first some, uh, and then the theory sometimes vice versa but it's not methodical it's it's not that I'm I'm researching a particular th theory like the more than human for instance and then I decide oh I should do a work that uh, tackles that um, I, I I think that would be at least for me too much too direct uh, a linkage um, oftentimes especially the the strangling piece I have a tongue piece that I haven't shown but is part of the same category if you will um, oftentimes the, the it, it, it's the, the germ of an idea I, I can't really find that what triggers it but what keeps me at it is uh, a certain um, fear of doing the piece uh, because it seems either absurd or too revealing to leaves me too vulnerable so when it when there's this that kind of thing attached to it that what what keeps me interested I think personally because um, I, I it, it leads me to down a path of self-questioning why do I have this fear why do I is there a certain kind of shame attached to it I don't want to get too much into the psychology of it but um, and sometimes there's a, a hint of humor as well so there's a, there's a kind of an attraction that I can't really fully articulate yet and that's usually what keeps me developing a piece and it's usually later that I can find context I can find other works by other people I can find theoretical threads so yeah that's that's the way I would answer that thank you are there I, I asked in the chat again please do write your questions in the chat and comments in the chat we still have uh, a few minutes Um, can you speak more, that's by Anne again, can you speak more about the 12 year durational? Yes, um, so after the residency in summer 2019, uh, Marla and I were working on this uh, sculptural piece. Um, I only had this 12 word sentence and I thought that was going to be the piece that was my kind of a personal take a personal kind of a little additional piece aside from our my collaboration with Marla but then um, then it became a website and the web and then I thought oh it's just going to be a website piece and it it had programming that made it change minute by minute over the span of 12 years that website wasn't functioning properly for uh, many reasons I wasn't quite happy with it but then the pandemic hit and and I I, I think that kind of a, a seclusion retreat into our homes uh, and there was you know many events went online and I attended several of those something clicked after attending a few and I thought well this, I'm I'm in the month of June to 20. Um, I've started this 12 year project, um, but but the you know the number 12 uh, was stuck in me, and I thought, well, maybe every December 12, I'll do a little gesture or something, maybe something private and something. I wanted to do a bit more around 12, but then it snowballed. It snowballed. I. I uh, almost despite myself, I thought, well, it's going to be, a, it has to be a 12 hour event. Um, I can't do it all myself and nor would I want to. Um, lots of artists are, don't, you know, have canceled shows or, uh, um, either exhibitions or performances. Um, I'll start off by asking some friends close to me and perhaps they you know, uh, one friend can take an hour, another friend can take another hour, I'll do an hour or two. And then it just snowballed and then uh, presenting organizations as well. I didn't want to assume that people could do this for free. So presenting or organizations oftentimes had, 
had budget that they couldn't spend because nobody was uh, coming physically to their spaces. So it, it has expanded since. I, I'm trying to manage the scale so that doesn't uh, get too large. It, it's not in my nature anyway. But I'm, you know, I'm already slowly starting to plan this year's event. I have germs of ideas for the future ones. Um, it, it's kind of been a great envelope context to, uh, and I'm wearing my curatorial hat as well as my artistic hat. And that's, that's been uh, interesting as well. It's not always, it's a, it, it can be tricky, but um, um, if you go on the website, that is basically the, the 12 word sentence uh, uh, .com, you'll see how documentation of the past three years. Um, it's an open invitation to contact me if you're interested in, in participating in the future to all of you. And uh, that's it. That's more on the 12-year project. Thank you. Thank you. There isn't yet another another question. There's a thank you from Nayan, but no other questions yet. And as we still have a few minutes, I'm going to just take this opportunity to ask a, a last question for myself, unless somebody just quickly wants to butt in and, and, and come with their question. One of the real intrigues I found by seeing this kind of non-chronological, but nevertheless body of work, Together, there is, as um, as Anne and others have remarked, there is a, there's an extreme beauty, particularly in the work also you did with Marla in the distillery, a beauty and a sort of sensoriality of material. And, and something was, I feel like, oh, I want to touch that. I'm not surprised this person wanted to stick their whole body in there. There is a kind of invitation to that. But there is another side there, and almost if one can say that, understated violence. There's somewhere for me in the work of violence that doesn't completely speak out as violence, but that has a sort of a contained, but nevertheless, there's a violence, obviously the, the strangulation piece, but also other pieces, even the sneezing piece have, have aspects of that. How do you relate to violence in your work? Yeah, that's a good observation. I, um, I, I think maybe counterbalancing the that understatement for me anyway is uh, is the kind of absurd ab absurdist or laconic humor aspect and sometimes the two are hard to separate for me but the violence part i just i don't like the word violence so i i mean maybe a certain kind of aggressiveness uh, um, uh, a certain kind of tension i think I think maybe I like I like I, I strive for works that are simple but not simplistic. And within the simplicity, it's about finding uh, layers, uh, which seems like a contradiction in terms, but so that maybe there's a kind of a, a one liner somewhere in there that you see either in the title or in the gesture that is being presented. But then that undercurrent, there has to be at least one. And I agree with you that um, it's it's a violence, maybe it's a, a, a self-contained one or a violence to self, or or maybe maybe the violence as you know, going back to Kath's comment is one that the viewer brings in or reads into the work. Um, um, I, 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 maybe the word that sometimes I use that it is not quite right is edge. Like defining a kind of a, there's a sharpened edge to the work that is not as, uh, for me, as evocative of the, I don't want to do work about violence, but for me, work that has an edge seems a better descriptor because then it's a bit more abstract, if you will. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, I haven't, I mean, I, I'd, I'd like to ponder some more on the violence and the fetish and the beauty and, and how they all come together. But I think we've sort of reached reached the end and hopefully we'll get another, uh, another occasion to do that. But I, I just, 
want to thank you so much for this um for this wonderful afternoon i'm really almost glad that um that mark got stuck in in finland and 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 sort of allowed me to do this so i could hear and really contemplate your work this afternoon and it was really enriching thank you so very much um christoph and i'm sure i speak on behalf of all the listeners here that it, it was really it had a wonderful rhythm and a wonderful presence so thank you very much I also want to, um, of course, thank um, Eka Mordecai, who's made this in the background technologically possible without any hits and glitches. So that's wonderful as well. Thank you very much. And I don't know what else exactly I should say, apart from that there are, of course, other Thursday lectures. Some of them will be online, some, some in person, obviously negotiating the current um, series of strikes. And I believe Mark, I'm sure, is in touch with you all to tell you when they happen and how they happen. So watch this space. But again, unless there are, there are loads of thank yous in the chat. And, um, and 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 a big um um thank you from me and um i'll jump in with um, my own set of thanks thank you so of course um um the it's been wonderful and thank you to all your comments uh, i i hope i get uh, uh, a saved version of the chat so i can ponder these questions some some more um it's it's always a little bit frazzling. Any kind of technical glitches that did happen were all all my own and negotiating the PowerPoint. Um, that's it. Great afternoon. Well, morning for me and anybody else who's in Toronto. That's it. Thank you very much again and goodbye everybody. I hope you all have a great evening or morning or afternoon wherever you are. <laughs>